Consoles come and consoles go. That's been the way of the video game world since the beginning, and it will probably stay that way for at least a while longer. When new hardware drops, it's always a party. But at the end of a system's life, when closing time finally comes for a video game platform, who serves last call and turns the lights off on the way out? I started playing around with computers, I guess. I was like 13 or 14. First published game I made was called Willful. It's like a 2D, I don't know, action adventure kind of game. And it's just something I've done in my spare time since then. In an industry long obsessed with racing along the cutting edge, we don't often hear the stories of developers who are the last to leave when a platform reaches its end of life. Stories of people like Luke Vincent, creator of the 2022 adventure game Automaton Lung one of the last commercial games that will ever come to the Nintendo 3DS. And if you're dusting off your 3DS right now to buy it, you're probably already too late. Life moves pretty damn fast. Let's rewind a little. The end of the 3DS isn't where our story begins. Automaton Lung is Luke's third game for 3DS a continuation of work that began in 2020 with a game called Harold's Walk. Oh man, so before Thumbs on Lung I had two other 3DS games called Harold's Walk and Harold Reborn. And after I made those, I was like, I cannot do that ever again. That was just very challenging to develop on the 3DS. I was developing for the new 3DS back then, and even that was just brutal. The Unity game engine, which powers all of Luke's 3DS creations, was only ever made officially compatible with the beefier new 3DS line of systems. But, if you're willing to dive headfirst into game dev hell, where not even Nintendo will help you, running on the original 3DS is possible. You can build and launch on 3DS, but they don't support any like troubleshooting, like if something goes wrong on the old 3DS, because it's definitely not built for it. The original 3DS has 128 megabytes of RAM, and Unity takes up half of that, so you're working in like 64 megabytes. So yeah, they really don't want you working on the original 3DS, but you can do it if you're stupid enough. 64 megs of RAM. Not exactly a lot of room to breathe. But that didn't deter Luke against his better judgment. The 3DS just had too much to offer. Even in the 2020s, the handheld's unusual bouquet of features sets it apart from the convention that modern portable platforms so rigorously conform to, and that kept Luke around. The 3D itself is a big part of it. I think the 3D is actually really cool and underrated. It can just be beautiful in certain games. I like how small and compact it is. I think it's one of the best forms for a portable console. It's very comfortable, easy to play the game. You can pick it up and put it away right away. You could have stuff happen when you close that clamshell lid or there's a gyroscope in there. It also helps if your game can be out in public for other people to see it in the real world. Even as the platform shows its age, the 3DS hardware is outwardly playful and social in a way that no successor has fully replicated. That resonated with Luke and themes he wanted to convey in his work. So, fascinated by a weird little machine that lived in its own pocket-sized vision of gaming's future, he soldiered on until he made some technical breakthroughs that opened up new possibilities for a third game on the 3DS. I was trying to re-optimize Harold's walk and found out that I was doing a lot of things wrong that I could be doing better. And I got to the point where, you know, even the original 3DS model, I could run these like big worlds and have all this cool stuff on screen. Just took the dive and decided I want to make this big world that people could explore, you know, in their pocket. The gate to an open world 3DS game had finally been opened for Luke, but the hardware constraints were still very tight. A situation like this, one of new possibilities tempered by hard boundaries, can help refine your creative direction into a sharp point of intention. That harmonious dichotomy led to Automaton Lung. That's one of the main things that separates it from developing on PC or Steam Deck or Switch or whatever. You're just forced to cut things and rework certain features to fit into that scope, and it ends up sometimes growing into something that's better than whatever idea you originally had. The resulting open world of Automaton Lung is one that channels PlayStation-era design sensibilities through a modern indie lens. The game's starting area opens into a miniature-scale overworld, traversed via aircraft and dotted with individual areas to explore on foot. These areas are vast, filled with mysterious structures and stray mechanical enemies. These robots and the player are the only signs of life and motion to be found. The 
cinematic thread tying the world together, conveyed through space, ambience, and color, is one of deafening emptiness. Sprawling spaces that bridge the natural and artificial, devoid of life, in a world of comatose stillness. As for the sparseness of the world, in 2020, when that pandemic hit, all those videos were out of, you know, all the highways empty, all the cities completely empty, and so I thought it'd just be really cool if you could explore big empty cities. Something that kind of expresses what that emptiness felt like during that time. I feel like in modern life, in this modern world, we're building an automated life support system. As much as I love technology, I think there's a reliance on it and a dependency. That's kind of the automaton lung we're building to sustain our lives. And that, that's what I wanted to represent with that icy blue, like cyan color in all the indoor areas. And then there's that, that big warm orange sun. You know, it's, it's never nighttime outside. It's always just a warm, sort of a comforting, life-giving sun. The state of automaton lungs world, gently decomposing as it lies abandoned in stasis, presciently mirrors the current state of the 3DS. Come March 27th, 2023, the 3DS eShop will be gone for good, taking with it an entire library of digital-only releases, Automaton Lung included. On top of that, it's already too late to add funds to your 3DS eShop wallet. That functionality was disabled back in August of 2022. For these several months in between, the 3DS is neither alive nor dead. All we can do is watch and hold our breath. Luke never intended to be a part of the 3DS's final moments, but he's happy that Automaton Lung has brought attention to the growing problem of entire generations of games disappearing, sometimes without a moment's notice. I guess I had a chance to enter it, but I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. Nintendo Switch Online is a prime example of this. You know, they have all these dozens of great first-party titles, and, you know, they sort of spoon-feed them to people, and you have to pay, like, a monthly fee. It's it's becoming like cable TV. Like, you know, you could buy Seinfeld 20 years after it released, but you can't buy Metroid 1 anymore after March. I guess that Apple model of making it as easy to use as possible is kind of destroying a couple of cool things that we could have maybe kept around, or maybe we can bring back. I don't know. Like the automaton lung that Luke described, the present of gaming is an era increasingly defined by digital frailty and impermanence. Physical releases of video games have been in decline for years, and even the ones that remain often depend on network services for core functionality. Those services all have limited lifespans, measured in years for successful games, and mere months for the less fortunate. Simultaneously, our video game past is becoming harder to access. The 3DS service shutdown will mark the complete closure of the Nintendo Virtual Console program, leaving its successor, Nintendo Switch Online, locked behind a subscription service with a less comprehensive library of titles. Video game history is now being defined more exclusively by its winners, leaving video game culture vulnerable. You know, big companies like Nintendo, they don't really care about people having access to all their old software, all their old games. It's very strange. I don't really know what we can do about it, but <laughs> hopefully something. Automaton Lung and Luke are both blessed and cursed to be standing in the light of a dying star. The game's core themes resonate with the impending death of its platform in a way that's truly extraordinary. Automaton Lung recently made its way over to Steam, where you can buy it no strings attached. However, I highly encourage you to seek it out on 3DS if you can, and soon. There will never again be a time quite like this to play it. I guess I want players to focus on their feelings, you know, the visuals, the sounds, all the stimulus they get from the game. and to remember also, you know, an increasingly isolated technological world to take time to talk to strangers and, you know, try to make the people around us happy. A world of games without a living past is a more isolated and solitary world. The context of shared cultural experiences that binds our personal relationship with games to a greater whole grows more fragile as access decreases, and expiration dates on games keep getting shorter. In light of that emerging world, Luke sees hope in the act of reaching out to the people around us in order to hold on to what's real. Sharing how we play what we love with the people in our lives might be our best shot of keeping an authentic, organic video game culture alive and thriving in an age where power and institutions seem content.
intent to let it disappear. Whether it be on stream or in person, playing together has never been more important. Have you played the 3DS with a friend lately? Don't wait. This is Aqua Lounge Deep Dive.